Good morning and welcome to Gardening with the Masters online. Today, if you didn't know, is Earth Day. And I think it's appropriate that we're here together today on Earth Day. The Earth provides so much for us, the air we breathe, our shelter, it provides food for us and beauty. And each of us in our gardens and in the world around us, we, we perhaps give a little bit of thanks for that um, today. And hopefully we're gonna learn more about how we can care better for our little corners of this world and celebrate the beauty that we have that we share together in this world. Um, today we have, uh, um, we have our, our lesson today is called What Works? And we have a panel of master gardeners with us and um, they're gonna share with us what they grow, how they grow, where they grow, and we're gonna hear their best advice for us. And we're also gonna hear from them their biggest lessons that they, that they have learned and that they hope that we um, can implement in our gardens. Um, as a reminder, I want to um, I want to encourage everyone here to put questions that as they arise into the chat, and we will look at those questions at the end of our um, of our panelist of our panel series today. So, um, but put your questions in as they come up. Um, and so, I'm going to ask each of our we have. We have four with us now. We may have a fifth person joining us on our panel. We have Lauren and Pam and Ginger and Sherman with us today. And I'm gonna ask each of them to introduce themselves. And when they're introducing themselves, I hope that they'll tell how long they've been a master gardener, where they're growing, what they're growing, what kind of soil they have. And while that's happening, some of them have sent in pictures. And so our tech, our tech um, host, Scott, is going to share some pictures of the gardens, just so you have an idea of what their gardens look like. And so I'm going to ask Lauren to go first. Um, Lauren, if you'll tell us again how long you've been a master gardener, where you're growing, what kind of soil you have, what you grow. Sure. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, my name's Lauren Mines, and I've been a master gardener since 2007. Uh, I have my garden in Rio Rancho, and uh, I have been gardening here uh, since about the, the mid 90s. So it's been quite a while. Uh, I use raised beds because our soil here is very sandy. And, uh, and of course, it's, it's fairly uh, alkaline in, uh, in nature and with very few uh, uh, amenities uh, for humus and, and everything else. The, the soil is pretty much sandy. And so uh, supplementing uh, the soil with uh, uh, Amendments, uh, compost, uh, manures is is very important to increase the content of organics in the soil. Uh, that's good for plant growth, and it's also good for retaining moisture. And both of those things are very important. Uh, this is a a photograph of the raised beds that I have in my backyard. Uh, some of the, the plants are perennial, uh, like uh, onion chives and thyme, and there's a small strawberry bed that's, that's perennial, but essentially the beds are uh, intended for growth of, of whatever vegetables I decide to grow. Uh, there's three beds, and they're all about uh, two of them are five feet wide. One of them is four, uh, but it's a total of about uh, 220 square feet, uh, just to give you an idea. These are, are constructed out of wood, uh, two by sixes essentially, and I just stack the two by sixes as I need additional room for soil amendments or whatever. Um, 
you'll notice that there is a structure that is above the raised beds. Uh, and that structure just attaches to uh, the, the garden shed building on, on one side and actually my shop at the back of the garage on the other side. So it's, it's very easy to support that structure and the wind doesn't bother it. Uh, on top of that are rolls of uh, shade cloth so that I can uh, roll out shade cloth and shade whatever parts of these uh, beds that uh, I desire to have shade. I, I don't typically use the shade cloth all summer. Uh, when the temperatures get above 90 or 95, I will partly uh, shade the garden because the vegetables like sunshine. So uh, I am exposed totally to the south. So I don't have any problem uh, getting enough sunshine to all of the beds. Uh, the, the largest bed on your left there on the other photo is, uh, is close enough to the shop on the back of the garage that it starts getting shaded about maybe 2.30 in the afternoon. So if I'm going to raise some uh, plants that like lettuce or spinach that will tolerate a little bit of shade, uh, I would locate them in that bed first. Uh, and they, they tend to do well if they're shaded a little bit in the afternoon hot sun. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. I'm going to ask our next panelist, Pam, to introduce herself and tell us a little bit about how long she's been a master gardener, where she grows, what kind of soil um, she has in the garden where she is growing things. So, okay. Pam. Hi. Thank you, Meg. My name is Pam Knudsen, and I have been a Sandoval master gardener since 2021. Um, the garden today that I'm uh, speaking of is the is a food production garden located in Corrales. Um, it is uh, the altitude is 5,023 feet, which I think is the lowest in the Albuquerque area um, or near so. But it is a third of an acre garden. Um, it is the family practice garden. The soil is loam. And um, so this here is a picture of in the, before the snow ends, we're putting out um, irrigation tape. So awfully chilly out there, but we're getting ready for spring. Go on to the next picture, Scott. please, Scott. This is a photo of um, after the irrigation tape is, lead, is laid, then we begin weeding um, and getting the beds ready for, um, for planting. These are some of our volunteers. This was uh, part of last year's harvest. The garden um, harvested over 8,000 pounds last year. Um, and all of this went to food banks. Um, the year before, I think it was 2019, there was only 5,000 pounds um, that was donated. And back in 19, there were three. So again, last year there were 8,000 pounds and we're hoping to um, bump that up again this year. And this is a photo, uh, something that we started last year and it was a really good success. It's called the Three Sisters Garden. It is a combination of uh, the corn or maize, and then you grow the beans, uh, like string beans up the corn, 
and beans provide nitrogen to the soil to help the, um, the corn. And then squash is below that and that shades the, the earth um, and helps, helps mulch. We're gonna try that again this year. It's, it was really fun. Here is the garden in full bloom. Again, our volunteers out there, we, we couldn't do it without these volunteers. It's just, they're just amazing. Um, we're continuing to both harvest and weed, um, adding additional compost is needed. Um, a lot of this green, at, le at least for the tomatoes in the very back, um, we used a commercial injection fertilizer for the first time and it made a big difference from um, a lot of times the tomatoes will get blossom end rot. And when we tried this method, it really, it really reduced, reduced that and gave a better um, supply of tomatoes. Thank you, Pam. And just to just to um, be clear for our audience, Pam is a volunteer at the family the Corrales Family Practice Garden, and this is um, so so. I, 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 as much as I think I would like to have eight thousand pounds of produce in my garden, I don't know what I would do with it. So 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 we're not. Um, yeah. So she's got lots of help too there. Um, our next person I'm going to ask introduce herself is Ginger, and um, Ginger, if you'll tell us how long you've been a master gardener, what you grow, what your soil is like, um, we'd love to hear from you. Okay, um, I'm Ginger Golden, and I've been a master gardener since 2014. I live in Rio Rancho, and so I have that sand soil. And I grow vegetables for my own consumption and my friends and whoever else wants it. <laughs> um, this is uh, basil. And I had a lot of success with basil. I had um, four plants and they were um, planted uh, along with my tomatoes. Um, my garden faces south, so it's it gets full sun from morning till night. And um, that can be a good thing and it can be kind of a challenge as well. Um, let's see. Like I said, the soil is sandy. So I do a lot of amending to the soil. It needs, oh, this is um, patty pan squash, which I, um, which I grew. And this illustrates how I mulch. This is, I use straw and I use a lot of it. And I think that helps the soil. It keeps it cooler, keeps it from drying out that the sun can do to the soil. And so it keeps the nutrients in there and keeps um, also moisture in, in there as well. Um, so I have, um, four garden beds. I have two beds that are in-ground beds. And then last year, I put in two raised beds. So this is one of the raised beds that I put in last year and filled with compost. And this is the green beans gone mad. <laughs> They're everywhere. And I had, I couldn't give away <laughs> I froze it, I canned it, I did everything, but uh, it was quite a success to have so many green beans and I've not been able to grow them in the past. They just didn't grow, but they sure did well last year. And um, so I do a lot of fertilizing because the soil is sand, so it has no nutrients in it. And so I fertilize on a weekly basis with different kinds of fertilizer. This is um, a photo of both of my um, new raised beds that I have. And um, I have the hoops on them so that I can put shade cloth over them if needed. 
And the one on the left, I'm growing uh, the tomatoes. I grew determinate and indeterminate tomatoes and um, cherry tomatoes, which I will not do again. <laughs> But uh, that has okra in it, also has eggplant in it. So I um, grow a variety of vegetables and the ones that seemed to have grown the best last year besides the green beans was the shishito uh, peppers. And they were a uh, big success, got a lot of those. Thank you, Ginger, all right. We're, now we're going to hear from our next master gardener, um, who is Sherman. Sherman, will you introduce yourself and let us know how long you've been a master gardener, what kind of garden you have, where you live and grow, what kind of soil, and how you amend the soil if you do. Okay, can, can they see me? Yes. Okay. My name is Sherman Levinson and I am a transplant from Las Cruces to Albuquerque. I became a master gardener in 2010, Doniana County. And then we have been in Albuquerque for the last four years. And uh, I'm a master gardener with Sandoval County for the last four years. So total of about 12, 13 years, plus some gardening and, you know, prior to it. Uh, I live in the Northwest part uh, of Albuquerque. Uh, the Ventana Ranch area, the soil is kind of yucky sandy. I really don't use any any natural soil at all. I do container gardening and I have one above ground uh, bed that's on legs. Uh, it is a raised bed, but it's it's on a, on a stand on the stand. Uh, I amend my my soil. I use commercial potting soil in my containers. And then I put my own amendments in it. And according to the different plants that I plant, I plant tomatoes and bell peppers, eggplant. I have, I have a strawberry patch, um, a couple of fruit, little fruit trees. Uh, I grow potatoes in the container. Uh, I come from a farm ranch operation where we used to grow potatoes out in the corrals in the old hay barns with just old tires. And we'd get tons of potatoes just in, in straw and manure and old, uh, in the tires. Anyway, uh, so I grow potatoes in my raised bed. I grow radishes and different lettuces and things in the, in the early spring. And then uh, starting in the summertime, uh, I go to squash in that bed. Uh, I use the, the commercial fertilizers, like I say, according to the different plants that, that I grow. Uh, I don't really have trouble, too much trouble with pests. Uh, I just spray them off with water or I'll use a Dawn, a, a solution of Dawn, Dawn a detergent and water in a spray and control them that way. Hand pick them, you know, visually pick them off, have a drip system. Uh, I haven't had, my biggest disaster, I guess, is probably overwatering. That's probably the nemesis of all the all gardening, either underwater or overwatering in it. I probably overwater a lot. And Albuquerque is so different from gardening down in Las Cruces. Uh, everything that I mentioned would have already been growing a month now in Las Cruces. And here, uh, I haven't even put veggies in. Probably around Mother's Day is when I'll start, start putting them in. And I do get a ton of vegetables. And I give them to the neighbors and the family and uh, donate them if, wherever I can. But I get an awful lot of vegetables for just a small container of gardening. My garden is east exposure with some south, south of east exposure. It's just a normal lot, home lot. So I don't have a lot of room. It's landscaped with gravel and plants and stuff. So uh, like I say, every, I don't have room for in-ground gardens unless I take out rock and really re-landscape, which I don't really feel like doing. And that's basic, basically it. I think I've answered the questions that uh, yeah, thank you. Yes. Thank, 
Thank you, Sherman. Thank you. It is, um, I know I'm a transplant here too. Um, and I think probably I would imagine that most people in this, <laughs> in this Zoom room are transplants. So many of us have had to relearn and learn again and keep on learning. So thank you, Sherman, for, for being with us. And I've got, um, I think we have one more pa um, panelist here who um, has joined us a little bit late. There you are. Jim, are you ready to I am. Okay, this is Jim, and um, I'm going to ask you, Jim, if you'll tell us what kind of garden you have, um, where it is that you're growing this garden, what kind of soil you have, and how you amend that soil. Thanks, Meg. I want to apologize to everybody right off the bat. I had a doctor's appointment. Both eyes are dilated, so I'm having a problem seeing. Uh, hopefully, my mind is still functioning. <laughs> My name is Jim Peters. I live in Placitas, New Mexico. Uh, I garden at roughly our elevation is a mile high. Uh, almost all of our gardening that is done here, for the most part, is in containers. I do have a couple of raised beds. I got to a point where I, I couldn't genuflect and get down very well anymore. So I decided I wanted to create beds that would work for us um and be able to raise and lower if i ever ended up in a wheelchair i could actually lower it and still garden so uh we raise almost all of the vegetables that you can possibly think of in my old age i've kind of learned it now instead of trying everything you can go to the next slide scott um the, we have uh tomatoes beans peppers okra uh, melons, uh, squashes, uh, cucumbers, all the lettuces and spinaches, beets. Those are some of our favorites. That does not mean we haven't tried a lot of other things. We have three in-ground beds or raised beds, I should say. One is devoted to asparagus, one is devoted to raspberries, and the other one, the one you can see on the left here, that's enclosed with PVC, and chicken wire to keep out ground squirrels and other types of uh, fun uh, animals that want to destroy your garden. Um, I use uh, commercial potting soil also, but I amend it every year and I typically sift out the roots of my containers and then um, change it to uh, a location so that I'm not growing tomatoes in the same pots every year. Let's go on with the next slide, Scott. Um, this was during the um, garden tour this past year. You can see that I'll use a lot of different tomato cages and wire cages to help the squashes, cucumbers, and everything else grow straight up rather than hanging over the sides because I know that um, I have some dogs that thinks that the, um, <laughs> the uh, squash blossoms and leaves of, of the melons and everything are like filet mignon and they will gladly eat them left and right. I use a lot of stainless steel tables. They were cheaper than wood. The uh, blocks is the cheapest thing I could find to raise my beds up. They're stable uh, and I grow different things in all of them. Next slide, please. I also love the uh, Shishito peppers that grow like wildfire here and they're great. I want to take this picture and show you. This is one of the, we found an old stainless steel sink. And uh, what I did was um, the stainless steel sink, someone else was using it for a potting sink in their house in Santa Fe. And so my wife and I acquired it. Um, I put it up on a stainless steel table so again, I wouldn't have to genuflect or bend over. And I found a online, a kit, the plastic, the PVC, it's not PVC, it's actually metal, but I enclosed it with, that happens to be uh, a plastic half inch uh, wire for the best, I mean, that's the best way I can describe it. You can also use uh, hardware mesh. And the nice thing about it, it keeps out the road run or the road runners, the quail, the ground squirrels, 
and the lizards that all tend to eat the very, very small uh, scrumptious plants. And that is all set up. In the next slide, you can see that I can actually lift the whole thing up and, and tend to the vegetables. This year, we have different types of, of beets in the, in, the, um, in the garden there on that one. And the nice thing in other years, my wife and I had developed uh, just got some shea cloth and she sh uh, sewed channels for me and I had uh, eight foot long poles that I can put shea cloth over the whole thing to keep the sun out of it becomes too intense. It also, when I bought the thing, I had to modify it a little bit, but it also had a tent that I could create almost a greenhouse effect and uh, protect the plants from frost, etc. So you can get very creative. Uh, I use, like I say, containers, you've seen them pretty much all the way through amendments. We use uh, compost and fertilizers. We have a couple of compost bins and we use those, like I say, all the time, with constantly switching out the soils. There's nothing you can't grow, but I learned again in my, more I do this, that I'm now just going after the things we really love and we can can, that primarily being beets, okra, tomatoes, um, and then, of course, the, the daily vegetables, the, the, the spinaches, the lettuce, et cetera, that we eat. That, that pretty much covers it. you got to get to prepare for those bugs and the, you know, the animals that sacrifice to the garden gods is what I call it. So thank you. I try to beat that every chance I get. Thank you, Jim. All right. So I'm going to move on to the next question for our panelists. And we've sort of alluded to it, but um, and we've heard a lot about um, about some of this, but I want to just just take it a little bit deeper. I want to ask you, who are your garden arch enemies? I've heard some about lizards, which I had no idea lizards ate things other than bugs. I've heard about some other pests. And so I'd love to know what are your garden arch enemies and how do you control or limit their damage? And Lauren, are you, is Lauren with us still? Oh, here he comes. Okay. I guess he logged off by accident. All right. Let me just go ahead and we'll move on to Pam first and then we'll come back to Lauren. So Pam, what are the arch enemies of the garden that you, um, that you volunteer with here in Corrales? Uh, there are two. One is the squash bugs, definitely. We do a lot of, uh, of squash at the family practice garden. And we actually even had to remove the squash plants because there were so many and replant. When we did that, it, it um, solved the problem for the most part. But um, when you see them, you pick them off, you pick off the squash bugs. Um, you can wash it with um, soapy water. Same with aphids is the other one, is just wash them off. Um, if there's any way you can get, um, that you can corral a bunch of ladybugs, that would be nice because they love aphids. That's their favorite meal. But um, mostly just picking off and, and spraying. All right, and so it's aphids and Squash bugs are the two big enemies there at the, yes. They're the big ones, yeah. Okay, Lauren, we're just talking about who are your, um, who are the arch enemies of your garden and how have you controlled for them or, or vanquished them perhaps from your, <laughs> from your midst? Well, well, I've had plenty of enemies. <laughs> uh, the latest one that's really, a, a difficult one is, is last year, I, I really had a bad case of root nematode. And uh, it, it just completely wiped out my carrots and uh, ha has always been somewhat of a problem with uh, things like tomatoes, uh, squash, uh, even bush beans, I've had some problems. Last year to try to combat some of that, I've been uh, companion planting with garlic and also with uh, uh, French marigolds. And uh, this, this 
spring early on, I tilled in all of last year's marigolds into the soil and then added uh, additional amendments for uh, uh, humus and compost and uh, to try to uh, improve the soil, but I don't know how effective it's going to be in, in getting rid of the uh, nematode problem. One of my raised beds, I've got three of them, and one of my raised beds, uh, I let it go fallow last year. So I didn't plant anything in it and uh, made sure I kept it weed free, tilled it several times. Apparently, tilling and, and retilling and retilling is one way of combating some of uh, uh, root nematode. The only other pest I've really had other than squash bugs, and I do have a technique that I use for uh, combating squash bugs a little bit anyway, uh, I had a, a pretty good bout with uh, uh, spider mites, red spider mites, and boy, were they hard to get rid of. Uh, you can blast them with water and get them off, but two days later, they're back, and they really were attacking mainly bush beans, and they were even going from one bed, and then they'd show up in the next bed. So, and, and that was a, a real problem getting rid of those. Eventually, I took, I took the plants out and uh, uh, put them in uh, garbage bags and, and disposed of them. But other than that, maybe uh, we've had a few four-legged pests in, in the past. I have had a pretty good bout with skunks. Uh, I even had uh, one year uh, a raccoon. And, and in, the, in a desert environment, I have no idea where raccoons come from. Uh, I also had uh, about one year with, uh, uh, well, wood rat, and just happened to, to make, decided to nest in my wood pile. And what he was really after was a, a, a grape arbor that was fairly close. And boy, he was harvesting grapes like crazy. When I took the wood pile apart, you could tell that on top of the vacant areas in the in the wood pile, he was making raisins, and it, it, it was almost incredible. But I, I ended up getting rid of him. But uh, the uh, the skunks were interesting. They uh, I actually live trapped three of them, and and the uh, uh, Rio Rancho. Uh, animal control will pick them up uh, and, and dispose of them somehow. I don't know if they let them go or what, but they were live traps. And uh, they, they just devastated a pretty good corn crop that I had. I, I went out one morning and every bit of the corn crop was laying flat and it was almost amazing. So I started uh, trapping them with a live trap and, uh, and it worked. I mean, I got three of them, and you would think that, that, that you know, what to pick up the trap and, and get rid of them, you got to really be careful about getting sprayed. Uh -uh. They, they never, they were so docile, I could not believe it. Curled up in the bottom of the trap and just sleep it. <laughs> and, uh, and of course, the animal control people know how to handle them and, and not get sprayed. But, uh, and, the, and the raccoon was the same way. Uh, you, you could come right up to the trap and, and, and they were sleeping. So, you know, it is funny. But in, anyway, those are my worst pests. But right now I'm really trying to combat the, the root nematode problem because if I don't, if I don't solve that problem, I'm probably going to um, replace the soil totally in, in the raised beds and maybe modify them so they're more like container type uh, gardening application. Thank, thank you, Lauren. It's really interesting how, um, as a new gardener myself, and in looking up to to people like you who've been doing this forever, that to hear that that you're still experimenting and trying new things, like the marigolds and tilling them into the soil to try and seeing what's going to happen. Thank you for for sharing with us your um, 
your experience. Um, Ginger, how about you? What are you, who are your arch enemies and how have you combated them? Squirrels. 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 One year I trapped and relocated 17 squirrels. <laughs> wow. I mean, that's all I was doing is, uh, you know, taking them to places where they didn't have squirrels. Now they do. Um, so that was my biggest problem is, and they will eat anything. And you can't keep them out of anything. I mean, fences don't work. They just, you know, get right in there. Yeah. Um, so what I found really helped was a dog. <laughs> That really helps. <laughs> she keeps them out. She chases them and keeps them out. So they don't do so much damage um, as they did in the past. I had fenced in my garden and they still got in. I don't, I don't know how they do it, but they can get in anywhere. Um, and in the past or last year, I had a, a big problem with squash bugs. And this year, I sprayed peppermint oil regularly on my squash plants and I did it on my um, tomato plants as well. So I didn't have any hornworms on my tomato plants and I didn't have any, well, I had a very few squash bucks. I would get out there every day and check for eggs and I would squash the eggs. Um, but the peppermint oil really helped. It's um, something that insects um, don't like the smell of and they will um, stay away from it. I also, with the squash, the vine pores that you can get with squash, I used um, aluminum foil wrapped around the stem of the squash. Um, in order to avoid those. And I didn't have any squash um, vine borers and very, very few squash bugs that really didn't do much damage. So yeah, but um, squirrels are the worst. <laughs> and when you were spraying the peppermint oil, were you mixing it in with water? And is there a ratio, was there a magic ratio? Yeah, yeah there's a couple of teaspoons in a gallon of water. Mm -hmm. and, and I put it in a sprayer and just, you know, spray the plants regularly, maybe twice a week. Um, I would spray them all and I, I didn't have any pests, didn't have any aphids, didn't have anything. Wow. And I also did companion planting, so that helped too. Okay, we're going to talk a little bit more about companion planting in just a moment. Sherman, how about you? What are your, um, who are your arch enemies and how have you battled them? The, uh, I think the only really two that I've had is squash bugs and, and aphids, and I just wash the aphids off and, and uh, just use the, that detergent and, and soap and uh, just combat them that way. They, I really have not had a big, big problem with them. I don't know if it's the area or if I've just been lucky, but uh, uh, no more than just a normal problem. They're not, haven't really been a headache. I seem to have been able to con to uh, control them. I find that after a, a windy, especially down in Las Cruces, when we used to get the blowing wind and this time of the year and even a little earlier, right after the wind, within a few days, I would have an infestation of aphids. And it must be, the wind must blow them in or I, I don't know what happened, but consistently over the years, I could just kind of count on a couple of days after a windstorm uh, you get aphids, and it's a similar situation here. It seems like when the wind blows, and and I don't have the sand here in town that we had there because we were on, on based on an arroyo area, but uh, we still had a lot of wind, and expected the wind this afternoon. I've got some plants I'll probably have to pots I want to have to bring in to keep them alive. But nothing as far as the pests. I had one episode with a squirrel. And I trapped him and relocated him and uh, used to do a lot of trapping in Las Cruces area because we were on an Arroyo uh, area and I would relocate them, but uh, nothing, nothing major, nothing disastrous here. Thanks, Sherman. Okay, how about you, Jim? Who are your 
arch enemies than. <laughs> I have all the same arch enemies. Um, the one thing, yes, I use peppermint also, but instead of spraying, I sink a starter pot of peppermint in every container that has a tomato uh, or anything else. Um, typically, and I, and I read about peppermint I don't know, in an RV magazine or something, and that's how they keep squirrels and mice out of their RVs in the winter. So I did the same thing, but peppermint is so invasive that if you don't keep it in a starter pot and keep it trimmed, it's going to take over everything. So in the winter, I just take them out. I take all the little pots out, put them in a big container, let it over winter. And then in the spring, I cut it back up, put it in the little starter pots again so that I can sink it with all my companion plants uh, throughout the garden. Uh, and I also put basil too in with everything. The squirrels, I don't think we have them so much because I have dogs. Uh, the mice, I about eradicated them, I think, because of the peppermint. They've gone someplace else. Plus, we had a very friendly bull snake uh, that uh, loved living here. And quail still come and jump on the walls, and somebody watches out for everything, and the rest of them go help themselves to whatever they want. Uh, that's why I had those enclosures. And then again, the lizards, occasionally um, the dogs are pretty good at getting rid of them, but uh, some of them get by and again, they nibble on all the infant plants. So that's why I use a lot of different types of cages that I've constructed. All right, thank you. Thank, uh -huh. you. <laughs> thank you all for sharing um, your struggles, <laughs> the battles that you engage in, in your garden. Um, the next question I have is about companion plants. Um, and so for those of those of us who um, who don't who don't aren't aware of companion planting is where you put two plants and you grow them together to benefit one or both or more of the plants. Um, and so I'm just I would like to know we've already heard some like Jim was just talking about planting the peppermint with his tomatoes because the peppermint keeps the pest away from the tomatoes. That's an example of companion planting. Are there other matches of companion plant of of companion plants that you found that work well for you. Lauren, do you have any suggestions of planting plantings together? Well, I've, I've, <clears throat> I've predominantly used uh, French marigolds and I had a lot of French marigolds uh, and I, I plant them randomly throughout the, uh, the raised bed to try to give some exposure, you know, all throughout the bed to uh, the roots of, of the uh, marigolds. Uh, I think this year I've been reading up on the root knot nematode problem. And I think I'm gonna also try chrysanthemums. Chrysanthemums are a, a natural uh, vegetative pesticide, if you will, for certain soil borne uh, insects and diseases. And uh, it, uh, it's actually the source of uh, some organic pesticides that imitate chrysanthemum. So I'll probably grow a few chrysanthemums and then the suggestion is, is to till them in uh, when they dry in the fall and just till them into the soil because the, what you're looking for is, is contact with uh, the areas that might have the, the nematode problem. Uh, it it uh, other than that, yeah, you know, I've I've used uh, garlic, uh, pretty uh, pretty much uh, in various locations in the bed, uh, and I don't know if that helps or not. But anyway, uh, we'll we'll see what the, the marigolds and the chrysanthemums do. I mean, it, it's a uh, there, there's really no pesticide that that's reasonable that I know of that uh, to get rid of the problem. The seed and eat garden had somewhat a similar problem, and Penny came up with uh, an additive that she's putting in her drip irrigation system, and had some uh, uh, success 
with eliminating the problem that she had with, uh, with nematodes. I have no idea where those buggers come from, but uh, like, like my, I had really good stand of uh, uh, carrots last year and it's the first year I have ever had a problem with carrots and they were just totally unusable. They were just full of knots and had not matured the way you would expect them to mature. And they were just, I just eliminated all of them. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. How about you, Pam? Um, do you all do companion planting at the family practice garden? And if so, what, what do you plant together? Well, we have um, the only companion planting we've done so far has been the three sisters beds, which are working very well. Um, we haven't done companion planting in amongst the vegetables in the garden, but we do have a large pollinator bed on the west side of the garden. And then at the very end on the east side, um, we have insectary beds. So what insectary beds are is that brings in, it, it brings in both types of insects, you know, the good ones and the bad ones, but, um, but, um, but between the pollinator bed and the insectary bed, it keeps out a lot of, a lot of problems. So what we're gonna try this year is integrating some companion planting into, into those rows. There's like 28 rows, I believe, in, in the garden. So we're gonna intersperse some companion plants. So we'll let you know how it goes. All right, thank you, thank you. And um, will you, so when you said the insectary, the insectary mix, you said it, it draws both. So it draws the bad insects away from the plants that you wanna protect, but it also attracts the, the insects that you want to have in your garden. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. That is absolutely right, yes. All right, all right, thanks, Pam. Um, Ginger, how about you? Do you do companion planting? And, and if so, what and how? Yes, I do. I'm a real believer in companion planting. I planted, um, like I, the photo, uh, basil. I planted four or five basil plants right along where my tomatoes were. And I also plant French marigolds. They were around my tomato plants as well. And like I said before, I had no insects on my tomato plants, no hornworms or anything. And, and I also plant nasturtiums and um, they're, really, they're really good um, as well. And they're so pretty. And they're supposed to um, attract aphids away from your other uh, plants, but I never saw any aphids on them. And that might be because of the peppermint oil I sprayed on them. Uh, <laughs> this year, I am going to um, add some uh, companions, um, chives. I'm gonna put in chives and I'm gonna put in onions. And that's supposed to also, um, keep pests away um, from your crops that you want. So yeah, I, companion planting is great. <laughs> Thanks, Ginger. You're welcome. How, <laughs> how about you, Sherman? Do you do companion planting in your containers? I have, I have done some. Uh, don't do them as a general rule. Uh, uh, I probably will maybe do some marigolds and that type of thing uh, this year. I didn't do anything last year and I I had one little episode with hornworms and picked a few of them off and probably got the mom and pop and who knows what and you know they they were gone so uh, it's kind of a hit and miss if I'm if I think about it and I'm in the right mood maybe I will use a companion planting but uh, as a general rule I haven't. Okay. All right, thank you. How about you, Jim? What other companion planting have you done? I mimic almost everything that Ginger's done. I use basil, I use uh, peppermint, I use some onions, I use some carrots, um, definitely marigolds throughout the garden. I have, um, 
some other flowers, but that's more for pollination more than anything else to bring the pollinators to the garden. Um, I think if you got marigolds and, and basil just makes the tomatoes sweeter and you've got the peppermint, you're getting rid of a lot of stuff out there. So it's all healthy. All right. Thank you. All right. The next question. Um, a lot of our a lot of our vegetables when we plant them out it says full sun but it doesn't say full new mexico sun our sunshine here is incredibly intense we saw lauren's picture of his shade cloth what else do you i want to just ask each of you how do you protect um your plants for the from the <clears throat> sunshine lauren you want to tell us a little bit more about what you do well uh one of the things that i do is i use grow cover and row cover, uh, I found, uh, really helps in, uh, in a lot of plants. Uh, tomatoes would be one for sure. Uh, and, uh, but I've used row cover, uh, like when you first seed, uh, the, say, say you put in a seed row of lettuce or something, uh, to go ahead and put the row cover on it because it keeps helps keep the moisture it, get, it gives enough enough shade where it helps keep the moisture in the soil so that those seeds have a better chance of germination so the red, row cover is the about the only other one my uh, my shade cloth that i use is uh, a 30 percent so it's not uh, a real dense shade uh, but and and sometimes I'll use that shade cloth where I'll shade the afternoon sun, but I'll let the morning sun in, mm -hmm. so I can adjust uh, the rolls one way or another, where I can do that. And uh, other than that, uh, I I tend to like to let su let the sun in, and and the other thing. Yeah, that's real important when it really gets warm. Like like ginger uses straw for a mulch to keep the, the soil moist so it doesn't dry out so quickly. I tend to use pine needles and uh, they don't blow so much. And, uh, but anything you can do for mulching uh, is, is very beneficial to the growth of, of most vegetables. All right, so mulching and shade cloth in addition to row cover. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. How about you, Pam, at, at the Corrales Family Practice Garden? How do you, uh, um, that garden is full sunshine, I think. So how do you, how do you control for that? It is full, full sunshine. A food production garden, it's, it's really difficult to, to control any sun. Um, other than some row covers, just like Lauren mentioned, and the mulch, uh, we have straw mulch, we've got all, um, we've got leaves, we've got whatever we can use to, to put, cover up the rows. But otherwise, um, most of them are just in full sun. Okay, all right, thank you. Ginger, how about you? How do you control for the sunshine? Um, well, there's not a, a whole lot you can do. I use shade cloth. So um, when the temperatures get 90, 95 degrees, I'm putting shade cloth over my beds. Um, and, and of course, I use the um, um, straw as a mulch to preserve the soil. Um, there are um, plants, and I'm going to try this this year. I understand that you can grow, um, if you grow sunflowers close to your beds, that'll help give them um, some shade. And so I thought, oh, it'll be pretty, and I'll try it. What the heck, you know? <laughs> so that's about it. I mean, shade cloth, I don't know what else you could do. Shade cloth and sunflowers. That sounds like a good recipe to me. Yeah. <laughs> How about you, Sherman? How do you control for the sun? I use a, a shade shade cloth, and then I have kind of a mesh uh, a wire mesh thing on my raised on my raised bed, and I'll I'll put a, some sun cloth on uh, on that. So that's about that's really about all I do. Uh, I have used I use some straw to uh, winterize some of my strawberries and stuff this winter, but the wind get a hold of it, and I have some artificial grass, and it blows all over. So 
straw is kind of messy. I don't, that's not my favorite, my favorite item, but uh, I do use a shade cloth. Okay. All right. And Jim, how about you? How do you control for the sunshine? Shade cloth, as I explained earlier, I bought it. And my wife sewed pockets in it. We ran some long poles through it so you can lift it up. And the nice thing about having the poles on the side is you can actually clamp it to certain things or put bungee cords on it because we have tremendous winds in Placitas. Uh, and that's about the only way you can keep it from blowing away. The other thing I've done in the past on some of my raised containers, uh, I would have a tomato cage in and then put a laundry basket on top of that. Everybody goes, what are you doing growing laundry baskets? Well, I'm not. <laughs> it does a couple of things. It, it actually uh, helps protect if you get uh, hail, number one. Number two, it makes it real easy to pull bird netting up over everything. And again, it gives you something to run a bungee cord to or clamp to. And then finally, in the heat of the summer, you can run shade cloth over the whole top. So if you've got 10 feet long and let's say two feet wide, uh, you're still getting plenty of sunshine, but it makes it easier to put it up and take it down. So that's what we do. All right, thank you. I've got one more question of mine, and then we're going to shift to our um, questions that have come in as we've been talking. And um, and I'm going to give you a choice here. So I'd love. I, I think we're we're all here as gardeners, no matter how long we've been gardening. It sounds like on a learning curve, and I'd love to hear either, or you can share both. Either what is the biggest mistake you've made in your garden, so that we, so the rest of us don't follow those that track? Or what is the biggest success that you've found in your garden? Um, so what is your biggest mistake and or what is your biggest success so that we can either avoid that track or follow you? So Lauren, how about you first? Well, I, I think one of the, one of the problems that, that I've had in past years is uh, way back when I first started gardening, realizing that I was gardening with a, a start of sandy soil. Uh, after I did some amending on the soil and stuff, I had the soil tested. And I, I haven't kept up on that. And I think uh, I'm at a point where I think I need to uh, maybe more frequently test the soil to find out are the amendments that I'm using enough? Uh, am I lacking fertilizer or do I have too much? Uh, to try to better monitor the, the condition of the soil itself and improve the production in the garden. Uh, I can tell over the years when I first started out with the raised beds that the production was very good and almost everything I grew was, was really good. And uh, I, I kind of have gone downhill a little bit in the way of uh, production and real quality uh, uh, vegetables, I think. And so I think, I think testing can really steer you in the right direction as to what your soil needs. All right, thank you. I'm putting in the um, chat that, um, that, that if you're interested in doing soil testing that you can contact your master gardeners for information on how to do that, um, how that can be done. How about you, Pam? What is the biggest mistake or the, the best success for you? Um, with the uh, family practice garden, John Zarola, who is a master composter has um, agreed to come in and he's um, helped us with a large composting pile. Um, all of our um, all of our waste, the waste um, from the tomatoes when you're pulling it out at the end of the year is it all went into this compost pile and it is like maybe a quarter of the size that it started out in. It's gonna be, it's gonna be wonderful. He's been a big help. Um, again, the three sisters bed has been great. And um, I'd like to see us do even more 
we have three three sisters beds and love to do that and while the cantaloupe was excellent the watermelon was not so um and the reason for that it grew just fine but then critters would get it and um either the four-legged kind or the two-legged kind would come in and, and so the production just wasn't there so <laughs> all right thanks pam how about you ginger what's the your biggest failure what lesson did you learn or are your biggest success um okay um i think what um <laughs> my mistake was um, on my tomato plants, you know, there's a couple different ways you can stake up your tomato plants. And I tried this thing called Florida Weave, which is where you, you know, had a post at each end of your, um, your bed and you take rope or twine or whatever and you weave it through the tomato plants, you know, and as they grow bigger, then, you know, you weave it Anyway, you constantly do that. Well, it didn't work. It was, it was on my determinate tomatoes. And of course I had branches everywhere and I couldn't, anyway, it was a huge mistake. Uh, and it was a mess and it didn't work. And my tomato plants were on the ground most of the time. Um, so anyway, that was my biggest mistake. I will not do that again. Ginger I may go no. back to no Florida weed. No Florida <laughs> no um, I'll probably go back to the old fashioned way where you just put a stake in the ground and tie your tomato to it. That's probably what I'm going to do. <laughs> Thanks, Ginger. <laughs> How about you, Sherman? Do you have, Sherman, do you have a mistake to share with us or a success that you can advise us? Well, the, the, the biggest mistake I, I think that, and I don't even know if it's a mistake, is, is uh, when we moved here is combating the weather and learning the weather patterns and when when to and when not to. Uh, I really haven't had any, any, I guess I've been lucky, haven't had any real failures. And my biggest success is that I take each one of my containers every year and I empty it completely. I built a, uh, a screen or a sieve that fits on top of my big, big wheelbarrow. And I empty every container through that and I refilter all of the all of the soil and take out all old existing roots and try to rotate the containers, and then I add add more amendments to it each year. So that's been my biggest success, I think. All right, I heard that from both you and Jim that um, even when you're growing in containers, that you need to switch. It's like rotating your crops. You're still going to have to rotate the containers to to have success. Well, that's I, I, I think trying not to to plant tomatoes back in the same in the same container uh, if you can help it you know right right thank you Sherman how about you Jim how's what's your I, I agree with Sherman 100 <laughs> percent uh, two things maybe three one you can't grow blueberries which I wanted you know you just can't do it here period give up on it forget it I don't care what you do number two the other thing that I learned um with the tomato plants, you have both the determinant and indeterminate. Um, the indeterminate, you never know how tall they're going to get because of our weather. Um, <clears throat> last year, June, first three weeks were over 90 degrees. It was, you know, grew plants, but that's all it did. And all of a sudden, I had all these tall tomato plants. Uh, and they outgrew the tomato cages. So what I learned to do was to take bamboo poles and insert them inside the tomato cages and take a couple of little uh, plastic clips, if you will, attach those to the tomato cages to make my tomato cages a lot taller. And then I had a place to tie off my tomatoes. That was one thing. The second thing that went along with that, because the tomato cages were that much taller, I had to use bungee cords then to support them against a fence or something uh, to keep them from falling over. So that was a learning curve, but I tell you what, I'll do it again this year because it really worked well. Did you have to use a ladder to harvest your tomato? <laughs> you know, the nice thing about bamboo is you can grab it, pull it over. I used it for beans too. Oh. You know, so you can have beans growing 10 feet in the air and you just reach and pull the bamboo pole over. 
pick it, let it go back up. It's like a fishing pole. So, I mean, it's brilliant, actually. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. I'm going to shift now to um, the questions that have come up in the chat. And so please, um, if you have other questions, go ahead and type them in the chat. I'm just going to go in the order that they've come in. And while, um, while we're getting ready to do that, I'm going to remind everyone here that Sunday um, is the um, Sandoval Master Gardener's plant sale. We're going to do it at the Growers Market in Corrales beginning at nine. It's cash only. Ginger's one of our one of our plant corralers and babysitters and she'll be there. You can meet her in person. But then also just so you know, every Sunday there's going to be Sandoval County Master Gardeners there to answer questions. And I've also put in, we have an email helpline. So you can get your questions answered um, that way as well. So let me look at at, um, these are, so there's a question about aphids and this person did direct stream of water, dish soap water and neem oil. It sounds like we got peppermint oil as a suggestion. Are there other suggestions? Do any of you have any other suggestions? Pepper, maybe try the peppermint. That sounds like a fun and nice smelling way to detract. Oh, aphids. Oh, we also had a ladybug. A ladybug, ladybug suggestion. Are you talking about aphids? Yes. Uh, getting rid of me, aphids? Mm -hmm. um, uh, the uh, nasturtiums Nasturtium. are good for that. Oh, the companion planting of nasturtiums. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. All right. Thank you, Ginger. All right. So let me see. Oh, this is a, um, a post from Maureen, and she says that St. Felix Food Pantry will take any extra available, any extra vegetables or fruit anyone has. So so if you've got extras, there's people, there's people who, who could benefit from that. So please do contact local food banks there. Um, there's a, a comment about squirrel relocation that, that needs to be five miles away into a different watershed. And so just be aware of that. Um, we have, um, oh, somebody else gave a root not nematode um, suggestion. And the secret to their success has been planting mustard in the fall as a cover crop. Mustard in the fall as a cover crop. Good advice to try. Um, this is a question about the three sisters. This is a good question. Did you get corn in your three sisters planting? We did. You we did. certainly did. Yes, we got Off. corn, we had beans, we had, it was just a total success. And when you did that, Pam, did you plant all of the seeds at the same time or did you plant them success, successively? We, well, you have to, the beans grow quicker than the corn, than the corn does. So you have to plant them so they're not, one's not overtaking the other. So the corn would get put in um, the squash and then the beans. Okay, and so how, how tall was the corn when you put the other two in? Um, I would say probably about between knee and waist high. Okay, knee and waist high. Okay, that's, a, that's good to know for those of us who are trying three sisters. And um, there's, there's, it doesn't just have to be corn, beans, and squash, um, you can, you can put tomatoes in a three sisters bed, but not with, um, but not with corn. So you could put sunflowers and tomatoes and peas. So oh. it's just the mixture of, you know, plants that can grow together, one that will cover the ground, one that grows up um, the stalk of a very tall vegetable. Okay. All right. Thank you, Pam. Um, this is a question. Oh, the peppermint. Peppermint sounds like a cure-all. And this person wants to know, will it also deter, deter birds? Do you uh, know? <laughs> um, I don't think so. <laughs> mice it will. Yeah, mice it deters will. Birds. But I, haven't, I haven't seen that where it would deter birds. Jim, what did you say about I birds? said bird netting deters birds. Bird netting deters the birds. And I do have tomato plants. 
Yeah. I do have one uh, bed that is covered with um, netting, bird netting. Mm -hmm. And yesterday there were two birds in there. Inside? <laughs> yes. Oh, no. I had to go open it up and let them out. I don't know how they got in there, but <laughs> <laughs> it's like, what are you doing in there? <laughs> um, so I, I do keep netting over that. Um, because I grow cabbage and um, uh, oh, Brussels sprouts and things like that in there, that the um, white moth, the cabbage moth, will lay her eggs in them. That's why you have worms all over those plants. Well, with the netting on there, she can't get in there. So I don't have that problem. Okay. And that's bird netting that you're put using for that too. I, yeah, I put bird net over my brassicas. Okay. Okay. Um, this is another question that came in about green beans, someone who hasn't had very much luck with them. And, um, and they're wondering if maybe the green beans need shade cloth. Does that Sorry. help them grow successfully? No, I didn't have um, shade cloth over my green beans. Hmm. Yeah, I think what they need is um, really good soil. Mm -hmm. um and that and you know composted soil they need really good soil and um but other than that i did fertilize them i mean i fertilize um practically every week i fertilize with fish emulsion and uh compost tea and alfalfa tea so you know, on a rotation basis you know um so i and i think that helps a lot fertilizing so you're adding the the extra nutrients that may that, that the green beans need to the soil mm -hmm. that way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. So and maybe, keeping, keeping the soil cool as well um, could help. With the three sisters, you've got the squash that's covering that soil. So that's keeping it nice and moist and covered. And then so the plant can grow well. Okay. All right, that's really helpful. So another question is um, about the mulching. I've heard a lot of you say stuff about mulching and, I, and, um, and wondering how you keep your mulch in place, especially those of you who use straw mulch. How do you keep it in place from, how do you keep it from blowing all over? The, all over? Well, I don't know. Um, I haven't had a problem with it blowing it over. Um, I think um, if it's a pretty thick layer of, of um, straw and when you water, it gets wet so that, and it stays wet for a while. Um, so I really haven't had a problem with it blowing away. Okay. I think, I think that's true. I, I think watering it kind of makes it mat down a little more and keeps it from blowing as much as, as rather than just leaving it dry. It, when you leave it dry, it tends to blow. But that's one of the reasons that I use uh, pine needles. Okay. Pine needles tend to not blow as bad. Okay, okay. And then there's a comment here that um, as far as mulches go, we have talked about pine needles and straw and, um, and compost can be used as a mulch as well. And the idea of the mulch is not only to, um, is to keep the soil cool, but also to, to, to um, keep the moisture in and perhaps even to allow some nutrients to seep through. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, oh, this is another um, transfer stations mulch up old trees, and this could also be used as mulch. So wood chips also are good mulch. Wood chips. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'd let them sit for a year though before I threw them on my plants. Because. Because I think oftentimes you got a lot of other junk in there besides the wood chips or whatever. You don't know what's really in there, mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's just safer to let them sit in a pile for a year before you start using it. That's, that's the fallacy of using somebody else's stuff. If you don't know what that compost is made of, and, and then you'll have like pine chips can be detrimental if it's very, very acidic to some of your plants. So you have to really watch using 
some of the, well, I call it sawdust or, you know, the chips on some plants that can be detrimental. So I'd let it sit for a year. Okay. All right. Good. Thank you. Um, we have a, about 10 more minutes. And so I'm looking at, to see if there's any other questions. And um, let me see, I've got this. I frequently have a pro problem with cell bugs nipping off my little seedlings. I've tried foil, which helps for the transplants, but the seed, seed grown are hard to, but the seeds are hard to do that with. So um, how do you keep the um, bugs from nipping off the little seedlings? I grow the seedlings and then transplant the seedlings when they're, I, I grow them in the greenhouse and then transplant the seedlings when they're a little larger. Uh, I, you can do that with lettuce, you can do it with spinach, you can do it with beets, you can do virtually all of those things. If you have an item such as a cucumber that really needs to be direct seeded, you know, you could probably put it in a container and uh, I've done things like put it in the ground, water all the way around it, so that when I take it out of the container, it's the same exact shape as the hole in the ground, and then it doesn't disturb the roots. And with peas, you can use cardboard, uh, little uh, toilet paper rolls, so that the, the roots are not disturbed either. There's ways around it uh, if you do it, but if you put them out too early, yeah, the bugs are going to get them. Let them grow someplace else in little containers and then transplant them and you'll probably have a much greater degree of success. Yeah. So, so the advice here is to start your seeds inside or in a, in a, in other than in the, um, the garden itself. And that's um, how I do it. Yeah. And that, and that reminds me that we do have other, um, we do have some other gardening with the masters online videos about seed starting on our web page. So if you'd like to learn more about that, there that, that is available. Um, I'm not seeing any other questions right now. So I'm just going to remind you that this is our, our last Gardening with the Masters online for this season. I'm going to thank all of our panelists for being here with us. Um, your Sandoval Extension Master Gardeners are here to help you grow. Um, and we are also, there's also some Gardening with the Masters live, it possibly in the works. And so if you um, keep up with us, um, then you'll find out more information of how you can um, get, get some more um, education that way with um, in, in a live format. But we plan to bring back this Zoom format beginning um, later in the fall. I'm seeing lots of thank yous on the chat for all of you. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you, Ginger. Thank you, Sherman. Thank you, Pam, for sharing your knowledge and your expertise and your wisdom with us. Um, we really appreciate each of you and, um, and we're looking forward to, to, to implementing some of what you shared with us. In, well, I'm looking forward to implementing what you shared with us in my garden. Thank you. I had a quick comment for Jim. Okay. Uh, it amazes me that they even sell blueberry plants here in New Mexico Absolutely. because <laughs> it, they shouldn't even sell them. You're uh, right. In, in Oregon, uh, I grew blueberries and I, we, we were starting with a soil pH of 6.8 hmm. and they didn't do well. Their berries were all small, but a, a, a nurseryman suggested one thing to me was aluminum sulfate. And we mixed in aluminum sulfate around the base of every one of those plants. And it made such a huge difference, I couldn't believe it. Blueberries need a pH of about five. And, and that's impossible in New Mexico. Yes, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, no blueberries. That's sad, but we've got a lot of other things that we can grow and you all have demonstrated that to us. And, um, and thank you again for, um, for your time with us and sharing with us your um, wisdom and experience. And we're going to end our recording now and, um, and say goodbye. So thank you. Thanks for moderating. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah. Thanks for moderating. Thank you so much, all of you. You guys are great. Um, you didn't, yeah, you were great. And I, I learned a whole lot. And oh, Sherman already left, but um, I learned a whole lot from you. And I, I really appreciate, appreciate you being here with us. That was fun.